Good evening, everyone. Hi, thank you so much for joining in this evening, taking your time away from your families and um, to to share a little bit of time. So I'm hopefully going to make this something that will be kind of interesting and uh, hopefully, you know, as we say, you know, where the rubber meets the road or what we can use first thing Monday morning. So kind of the topic for tonight is around um, when a well-equilibrated splint does not do the job. So, and as we know, you know, uh, splints 99% of the time, 95% of the time really kind of do a great job for, for what we need. Most of our patients come in with, with occlusal muscle disorders and, and it's just kind of, we know that if we can uh, get rid of occlusal prematurities and, and balance out muscle activity, we can definitely be helpful. So one thing I always like to bring up is, is you know, we'll, we'll talk about tonight about things to notice. If you notice something that's, um, um, that not, you don't kind of expect, or, you know, you're typically, you know, we call it pattern recognition. When I do splint therapy, I always get this response. And, and a little bit of my mission for tonight is, is that that doesn't always happen. And when it doesn't happen, then, you know, what could be some of the variables involved? So just, just kind of starting off when we look at kind of, and this is, you know, I am a oral surgeon and, but I've done, you know, kind of in order for me to do what I do really well, you know, really understanding occlusion, understanding how, uh, how the joint works, how the overall system works has just made me, you know, better at my job and and kind of being able to, you know, really care for a large variety of patients. So um been a really a pleasure to do. And and as a surgeon, I'm always going to say that one of my favorite things is is I, I like to help patients they don't need surgery and looking for for versions of, of options for them so that um you know that 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 we have a variety of options for them. So, but kind of, again, this is a, uh, an example of one of my splints. Um, and please, you know, we can talk about variety. We can talk about different philosophies of, of the actual design of the appliance. But, but basically, I think we all feel pretty comfortable that we're treating from a seated conlure position, that uh, posterior teeth hit when we're in a seated conlure position, light contacts on the anterior teeth, and then when we go into excursions and protrusive excursions, we ride up our cuspids. As cuspid, the movement should be very nice and smooth, very balanced. Uh, there shouldn't have a lot. There shouldn't be any muscle quivering or evidence of muscle uh, incoordination. When we go into our anterior teeth, um, that we really are able to disclude our posterior teeth, and really all of these motions should occur in a very coordinated movement and. I affectionately like to describe it as their ice skating that's so smooth that the muscles are comfortable. So when everything's done well, there's still some some outliers, some outliers that just don't respond like we would expect them to. So so kind of looking at at something like that, one of the examples, and we'll go through each of these in a lot of detail. And and again, please, if you have questions along the way, please add them to the um to the chat box and, and Desi will put them together at the end for us. But so first, um, you know, I'll say one of the scenarios we potentially might see is unable to connect, uh, unable to contact our posterior teeth. So they go to close down and really the only thing they touch is their anterior teeth. And when they try and squeeze down, they try and force their teeth together. They typically, and my favorite thing is, do you feel any pressure as you're clinching in front of your in front of your ears, and we'll talk about more detail about that. The next scenario I'd like you to kind of consider would be is, you know, every time I see them, I'm seeing my patients routinely for their appliance, and and I call it a summer bite. Sometimes they're biting here, sometimes they're biting there. That their their markings are not consistent. So we'll talk about potentially reasons why that might be. And then, you know, again, we have our patient. Ideally, we work this occlusion. It's it's beautiful. Our appliance is marking the dots and the stripes. Uh, street all look beautiful, but they still can they still complain about muscle soreness. So, and we'll talk about potential reasons why that might be. The other would be is we put somebody into an appliance and they come back, and next thing they know, they're only hidden on their posterior teeth. And I wonder, Doc, what did you do to my bite? I'm going to say the, you know, and then blame the appliance for it. I'm going to, we'll talk about why 
what happens, why it happens, and then ultimately, again, options, what to do with that. So the other would be is I, I patient comes, they, they say, you know, I woke up this morning, I can only open like two fingers, I can, can't get my jaw open. And when I go to open, it's not painful, I just feel like I hit a brick wall. So we'll talk about what, what that is. And again, uh, how an appliance might or might not be able to help that. Limited lateral excursion. So I'm going to pair that in kind of with the limited limited opening and hitting a brick wall sensation, and which we'll talk in detail. But I can go one way, but I can't go the other way. It just feels like, again, I hit a brick wall. So my range of motion is limited. And the other, this sounds unusual. We'll go into this. But some people are just, I put this appliance in my mouth and I just got to spit it out. I just or I just can't seem to keep it out, or in the middle of the night, it ends up at the floor, the floor by, uh, at the, on the floor at the edge of the bed. Um, so just kind of figure out reasons why people might have, have that as well. And then last topic we'll discuss will be is, is persistent joint noise. So I have a beautifully equilibrated splint, but my noise, my joint is still kind of clicky and poppy. So, so let's jump in and kind of talk about things. So, so first thing I want to talk about is, is this concept that if I'm unable to contact the, my posterior teeth, that, so what I'd like you to think about is, is that, um, and I affectionately describe it as a sprained joint. And the, the typical scenario will be is, is that I, I woke up one morning, my jaw was a little stiff, I had trouble opening it, I opened, I heard a loud pop, I felt a sharp zing, and after that, I just could not get my bite together. So what I typically would explain is, is that inside of the joint, we usually see this in, in situations where the meniscus has been displaced for a period of time. And rather than functioning on the disc or the meniscus, now we're functioning on the posterior ligament. And think about that posterior ligament as being kind of like a, a dense sponge. So as we as we have any parafunction, tension within our jaws, we compress those sore tissues. And what ends up happening when the kind of describe it as basically the, the posterior ligament, the retrodiscal tissues kind of gets a little suction cup to the, to the top of the fossa. And the first movement of the day, we, we pop free uh, the joint, get it moving again, but we pinch those soft tissues. And when we pinch soft tissues, we create edema within it. So the interesting thing is, so when we think about when you get swelling in your jaw joint, so what ends up happening is, is we look at our, on our left, our condylar position, and basically what ends up happening, that swollen tissue actually displaces the, the condyle downwards and forwards. And if we look at what it ends up doing, and let me just kind of show you that again, look at our anterior teeth. So as we get a joint edema, our mandible actually comes down and forward. So we end up kind of hitting our, our occlusion changes and we end up a little forward of our, of our normal bite. And then if we kind of mimic what happens when, and say this were occurred on your right joint, when we look at it, if we look at the picture next is, is when we get that kind of swelling in the joint, it actually pushes the mandible to the opposite side or contralateral side. And we end up with an anterior opposite side prematurity. So, so the thought is, is the, the thought with that is that when we get the edema in a joint, the mandible goes down and forward, but co goes to the opposite side. So they end up, I only touch heavily on my contralateral, my opposite corner, very classically, and I can't get my back teeth together, usually more on the, on the side that's uncomfortable. And when they try and get it, uh, try to do it, this is where the difficulty lies and, and it's uncomfortable to do it. So kind of what that looks like, joint edema, this is an MRI and uh, what we call kind of a, a stir view. Stir view is selectively showing us inflammation within the joint. Um, but kind of just real quickly looking at it, just for those that don't look at MRIs a lot, my cursor is on the ear, the opening ear, the circle. And if you follow, there's a black line that kind of comes down and that's a, the fossa and then coming down the articular eminence. Here's our condyle. And then if you look at it, ideally the disc or the meniscus should be somewhere in this area. And 
And when I go, when I just kind of survey from over top the head of the condyle, all I see is lighter material. And, and ideally, if the disc of the meniscus were there, it would be it would be darker. So then I slide forward, I see this kind of bulgy, kind of almost accordion-shaped, V-shaped meniscus or disc, and that shows it's anterior displaced. But all of this lighter color is all inflammation. So when we look at it, every time you put pressure on those areas, you seat your condyle, you apply occlusal forces, you end up basically putting pressure on those very sore tissues, and it's very uncomfortable. So looking at this as kind of, um, you know, what happens when we get an occlusal change? The same is going to happen if we're like one day, uh, I hit my anterior right, I check the appliance, I come back, and maybe they're hitting their posterior left. The, the dots are changing or not consistent because because of when there's more swelling, the mandible goes further to, to the opposite side. When there's less swelling, we can maybe get our teeth together. And then we do something like eat a meal, not anything overly crazy, but what ends up happening, we create a little more inflammation and our mandible is just kind of floating. So again, the patient's going to describe that as, I just can't find my bite. It's kind of everywhere. So um, so things to kind of look at. So I, I bring these little points up and I describe it as, you know, pattern recognition. When you say, when you start to see someone first, if you hear, I can't find my bite, the first thing I'd like you to think about is, do they have edema in their joint? The next thing I'd ask you to do is ask them to, you know, gently either seat their condyle manually by manually manipulating, or my favorite thing is have them open their mouth a little bit, roll their tongue all, all the way back, touch their tonsils, and lightly close the teeth together and see where their first point of contact is. And, and then ask them to squeeze down at that point. And if they feel pressure or discomfort in front of the, in front of the ear, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna be highly suspicious of, of joint edema in this case. And we'll talk a little bit about how we manage that. But the other interesting thing is I describe this as if my joint hurts, I'm gonna do something where I'm going to, um, Kind of, I'm going to protect an injured body part. So I like the example of this picture with the elbow. If my elbow hurts, what do I tend to do? I tend to keep my elbow up high and close to my body. And the longer I'm doing that, I end up my neck and shoulders start to get kind of really sore because of just sustained contraction leads to lactic acid buildup. So we have a patient that has joint edema. You know, what are we going to do? So kind of first step, we always you know think about you know, if we have inflammation, active inflammation. So we're going to think about an anti-inflammatory protocol. And I like to think about the protocol a little different. So some people are like, well, I took a Motrin, it didn't do anything. I took an Aleve, it didn't do anything. But I'd like to consider inflammation kind of like a smoldering fire, meaning that if we have inflammation um, and that's, and we basically, we, we can put out the flames, but the embers are still there. So the concept that I believe is with anti-inflammatory therapy is, is we take it once, you take it again and take it again. You kind of do it consistently because the importance of taking it, each time you take it, reduce a little inflammation. You take it again, reduce a little bit more, take it again. So I typically like to do that from anywhere between two, two to four weeks and really just ensuring that we can, that's something that we can take that they are taking it. And, and I usually talk about, well, you're not doing it for pain, even though they might be uncomfortable, but we're doing it to reduce the inflammation and, and really kind of put out any smoldering embers of, of inflammation that might be there. The other thing I like to do is I describe it as, as eliminate the occlusal awareness. And what I mean by that is when people have their bite that feels like it's not fitting together, Basically, they like to like, okay, I am going to get my bite to fit together. And every time they go to clinch to try and bring the teeth together, they're going to squeeze against inflamed tissue. So, so that acts as kind of a constant injury, rest, re-injury phenomena where just kind of, they end up in a cycle. The other thing I like to do, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but gentle side-to-side -side movements. Because joints, the way they get their nutrition is movement. And when we think about side-to-side -side lateral excursion movements is that's all lateral pterygoid muscle, but not a lot of masseter temporalis muscle. So I like that because 
as you're moving the jaw, you're you're circulating the synovial fluid, you're getting nutrition to the area, you're stimulating uh, things, you're also kind of freeing up any sticky bubblegum uh, adhesions that might be forming in there. So I usually do it 10 repetitions side to side, at least four times a day, and, and especially in the morning being the most important thing. So I think, you know, it's fair to give this a try, give it, you know, four weeks or so. And if they don't get any better, what would we do for them? So for me, the workhorse procedure for me is, is something called an arthrocentesis. And if you don't mind, this is just a real condensed version of it. But I have a needle into the sphere joint space, into the joint. And basically, I'm hydraulically distending the joint space. And we kind of see that in this picture, you can see the, the capsule kind of distending as I put fluid in there. And basically now next kind of force fluid in there. So I balloon up the joint space, break up any adhesions, and then I'll add a second needle. And there we go. We see how, how it inflates the area, how we're distending it. And we'll see a kind of clear fluid just coming out. Um, and that's basically the fluid that I put in there. I'll put a second needle in and flush out. So we'll put about 80 cc's of, of lactated ringers or normal saline to flush out the joint. So here's my second needle that will go in. And I really just kind of follow the trajectory and I know I'm in the right spot because I can put fluid in through one and it will come out the other. So an arthrocentesis, I'll typically follow up with, with platelet-rich plasma as my anti-inflammatory and see this picture will see the fluid coming out. So I'll do a good flush to get rid of the inflammation and the inflamed tissues. The platelet-rich plasma now ends up as an anti-inflammatory as well. So Arthrocentesis has been my favorite statistic. I like to tell people, well, how often do you need to do it again? And I, I typically say there's less than a 5% chance if we do it once that we'll have to do it again. But we'll talk about protocols and things like that. So, but really a, a real robust procedure. And I would encourage everybody to, to find a surgeon in their area that's that's doing it. And if they are, if you can't find one, you know, of course, be my pleasure to help out, but it'd be a pleasure, my pleasure to kind of teach anybody that's interested on how to do it, because I think it's such a valuable procedure. So, so please, if I can help any way, I'd like to get that, that mission out there a little bit more that, that we are taking care of these people early and getting them taken care of. So by continuing on, the next thing we kind of look like is the development of an anterior open bite. So when we look at this, this is a, a cone beam CT scan. And I apologize, as these are STLs of, of, uh, of models, not live pictures, so I apologize for that. But basically, when we look at this, let's do our anatomy of the joint. So where is our condyle relatively positioned relative to the fossa? So look how big that space is between the, the head of the condyle and the fossa. So that condyle is not fully seated in the condyle. But if we look at their occlusion, the occlusion is they look like they have a pretty good, you know, intercuspation. So this was a very challenging case, and this was something that our friend uh, Dr. Stephen Malone helped me with. But basically, we were able to kind of get this patient. I actually had to put her to sleep, and when I put her to sleep, look at what her occlusion looked like. She only contacted on her posterior right teeth, but it, as soon as we were able to get her there, I squirted some blue mousse in there, woke up from anesthesia have her hold that position, and I was able to capture the, um, capture the condyle fully seated. So basically, you know, this was a, a huge, uh, a huge occlusal discrepancy, and it was really the clue was that that condyle wasn't in the fossa. So you would call this a CRCO discrepancy or a discrepancy uh, from MIP, maximum intercuspation, to fully seated condyle position. So so kind of looking at these patients, and, and this can be, a, you know, when you deprogram a patient, you take away their, their proprioception, their occlusal reference points that the, count, that the, that the mandible can see. And, and here's two examples of cases that can really fool us. This is a, a patient on the left who has had, uh, had a, a condyle fracture at the age of, of uh, as a teenager. He had a nine millimeter slide from, from C to condylar position to MIP, uh, and he's mutilated his dentition because he just spent that time obstructive sleep apnea or a variety of things. But, but he wouldn't show us this occlusion. We had to work to find it. Once we deprogrammed him, 
using an appliance, we found it. Here's another case. It's a young dentist that lived in, in MIP, but complained about a lot of muscle soreness to be able to hold a mandible in a forward position. So it was really kind of, you know, she she hit it well, but she had a lot of anterior wear for a 28 year old. And, you know, it was really just interesting, but she didn't, she wouldn't show you what her cedicondylar position is until she was deprogrammed, until we put an appliance in. So, so these are those things like, did we cause the anterior open bite or did it, was it always there? And, and we basically, you know, took away the muscle activity that held them into an MIP position. So a little spooky if you don't expect it, but if we see it, we know that we didn't cause it. And basically the way to prove it is uh, a cone beam CT scan in MIP and then one in C to condylar position. And you'll see a market change in your a difference in your condylar position. So what do we do with these patients? So one, you know, appliance. So we can put them into an appliance and, and um, you know, basically this becomes their, you know, 24 seven or, you know, functional appliance. Uh, or we will wear it at night, but it's still going to be always that discrepancy. So a little bit of a challenge that they truly have a skeletal discrepancy between which causes this MIP uh, to fully or fully see a kind of position discrepancy. So, you know, again, you know, I'm sure we all have these patients in our practice and they do great with appliances and we, we work them well on that. But there's another situation where, again, I, I focus in on that this is not a dental malocclusion. It's typically a skeletal malocclusion. And if that's the case, and and not to be self-serving, but as a surgeon, I'm going to say, and as a surgeon that loves orthodontic surgery, you know, really see this as, you know, if someone's got this huge discrepancy or a large enough discrepancy, then they probably have a variety of other things, airway, uh, what are, what's the muscle activity that holds them in MIP, you know, that we start to think about that, you know, is is correcting the skeleton really that uh, that far-fetched or is it really truly treating the, the root cause of the problem? Of course, making sure the joints are stable and we do all the you know, vet, appropriate vetting, but just ask everybody to kind of consider Here's our choices, an appliance lifelong or, or correcting the skeletal discrepancy and, you know, and stabilizing their bite. So their MIP and their fully seated column position are now the same position. So something to consider. So kind of moving on, you know, so is, you know, with these patients, you know, muscles are still kind of a problem because if they're in the appliance, hopefully, and treating them from a seated column position, the muscles can relax and not holding their mandible in a forward position into MIP. But there's another thing that I've been noticing, and, and I'd like to kind of throw this out as a as a, a new concept for everybody. But the other thing that I look at is if your muscle soreness persists, then I start to look at kind of what could be another reason for it. So I look at these pictures. So the X-ray on the on the, uh, the lateral head film on the left basically it says, okay, here's a patient has a reasonably good looking airway. If I were to do a little skeletal geometry on them, uh, cephalometrics, I'm going to say they're markedly retronathic in both the maxilla and the mandible. When I look at their cone beam, though, I look at what is their tongue doing? The tongue completely fills up the oral, the oral cavity. There's no tongue bubble. And what that tells us is that the tongue, and I, there's one little very subtle thing, and I'd ask everybody that looks at cone beam CTs, when they look at this view, if you look at the posterior aspect of the tongue, someone that's compensating, someone that's holding their tongue forward, the back edge of the, of the uh, tongue tends to be flat, tends to be straight up and down. So just an observation, I haven't seen any literature written on it, but just by looking at it, if they're pushing their tongue or pulling their tongue towards the genial tubercle, which is on the inside of the chin, that the tongue tends to fill up the oral cavity, so it completely fills up the full, full palate, and the back of the tongue tends to be flat in, in appearance, straight up and down. So the other thing we look at clinically is, you know, the middle picture, which is kind of their scalloping of the tongue, and we can see all the indentations of, of basically the whole upper and lower dentition in the tongue. 
So I guess if you don't mind those that are listening and I'm gonna ask you to, to close your teeth lightly together. If you put your fingers on your masseter muscles and if you take your tongue and push your tongue as hard against your teeth as you can, can you feel your masseters activate? So, so if you don't mind, I, I use myself as an example. And I, I was at the airport while I was preparing my lecture and I'm like, Ooh, why not? Let's use myself as an example. But um, just for, for the sake, I have, don't have any scalping on my tongue and thank God no obstructive sleep apnea, but I got really big muscles. So let me show you. So when I, what I'm doing here is I'm, all I'm doing is I'm not clenching my teeth together. I'm just pushing my tongue against my teeth. And we can kind of see how, how much contraction of our masseters we get. So the story goes, why are my muscles stay sore? Is if I'm holding my mandible in position, because my tongue's attached to my mandible, and if I'm gonna push my tongue against my teeth to keep my airway open, I have to activate my masseters, medial pterygoid muscles, temporalis muscles, lateral pterygoids, digastrics, all these muscles to hold it in place. So my muscles, masseters get tired. And a lot of times these people don't put their teeth together. So we all, we blame it on clinching and grinding, but I'm gonna say that, are they stabilizing their mandible? And is that their reason for, uh, for their persistent muscle soreness that doesn't resolve with an appliance? So just planting a seed and something to kind of consider. So, okay, what do we do about it? So I'm going to say kind of, you know, and this is kind of a really big arena for me now and kind of where in, in things that I'm dealing with on an everyday basis. So we kind of say, okay, like now we're into that airway that our muscles are working to stabilize our airway. So how can we address that? So kind of looking at, you know, something that has got gained a lot of popularity and something that I'm doing a lot and recommending frequently is something SFOT, Wilkodonics, uh, PAOO, so many different names. But basically what we do is we score the bone around the teeth, flap up the, the tissues, score the bone. I call that bone softening. And then we add bone around all the teeth and then bring the soft tissues back into place. And then usually using clear liner therapy, I think, I think there's some advantage to doing it. Um, versus applying versus a, a traditional orthodontic appliances. But then we expand out the arches. And what we can do is typically, I call it building real estate. So we build out the bone so that as we move the teeth, we can now move the teeth back past the alveolar housing or the edge of the alveolar housing into this newly new real estate we created. And we can get five to eight millimeters of arch expansion, you know, basically somewhere between two and a half to four millimeters each way. And we can do that in both the upper and lower arches. And the concept is, is by doing that, now we have much more room for our tongue. And if our tongue is more forward, less of it hangs out the back and we open up the airway that way. So kind of SFOT in a really quick, uh, quick description. The other thing we start to look at is, is around how can we make everything wider? So the other thing we, that's gotten a lot of popularity now is, is separating the, the midline of the palate. And we've been able to do that in adults as well. And basically because we're using a bone, uh, at, we're expanding the bone using temporary anchorage devices. And this has an acronym, um, MARPI, um, basically micro anchorage palatal expansion. And we can actually separate in a select, few, a select group of people, their midline suture and expand the maxilla. So the this is this this works typically well. It typically works well with women that are younger and maybe younger men. But anybody that's got any pair of function, anybody that's got um, either tori or buccal exostoses, big muscles, I'm concerned that they're they've really uh, built up their bone under occlusal load. And subsequent, subsequently, you know, their bone is really dead. So I'll go in and make little surgical cuts, Lefort one osteotomy cuts. We use a MARPI, a, a, a TAD, TAD a supported palatal expander, and then we'll gradually expand it, create a nice little diastema, which would have been great two days ago for Halloween, 
And now we've expanded the arches and we matched the lower to do it to the upper. So we've actually been able to gain much more transverse width, making more room for the tongue. So again, if more of the tongue can be in the oral cavity, then less of it hangs out the back and we open the airway that way. So, and that these, you know, great choices, but we also have to kind of consider that's all about making everything wider, which, which has been kind of a good journey for me that that has been more, more beneficial uh, than I would have expected it 10 years ago, but been exciting and, and definitely one of the options that I present my patients for those that, that, that need it. And that I feel confident that that will be their solution to their problem. So the next thing is, is, you know, that we talk about maximal mandibular advancement surgery. If we have somebody that's got such crowded tongue, muscle activity, you know, uh, and, and this is a little tricky because not all of my patients that I, that are retronathic have obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, and this is where it's very common that we we get into that realm of something called upper airway res, uh, uh, upper airway resistance syndrome, where where basically they respond very much to when there's restriction in airflow, the muscles really activate, and, and this group of people can be really symptomatic. So, looking at jaw advancement surgery, even though it seems like a big deal, but in essence, I'm, I describe it as we're really treating the root cause of the problem, and the root cause being, you know, how do we how do we get the muscles to relax? And you know, typically, what I would do with somebody that's got a lot of muscle tension, their tongue feels very crowded. And one of my favorite questions is, is so to ask patients, like, so how's your tongue feeling there when you put your teeth lightly together? How's it feel? Does it feel crowded? If it feels crowded, then I'm going to say, well, try that. What if you bring your jaw forward? You put yourself into a protrusive. How's your tongue feel now? Ooh, I got room. So what that tells me is, is that you know jaw advancement could be a very, a very good thing. And we can talk about mandibular advancement devices, but but my feeling is is that especially younger people that that are having this, this does not get better with time. And how do we make them healthier going forward? So, you know, this is where, yes, maximum mandibular advancement surgery or orthognathic surgery can be, is a big deal, but we can do it. We can do it well. We can do it predictably. And, and if it's really true, the treatment root cause, you know, I, I think it needs to be in our, in our, uh, our box of, of things to consider. So, um, so moving on kind of things, the next thing we try to talk about is I have somebody comes in, I can't open my mouth. So the thought would be is, is, you know, typically one of my favorite ways to test to see is somebody opening limited because their muscles are tight or is it intercapsular or intraarticular related to the joint? So my one simple pearl test that I like to do is I ask the patient just to, so they open, I ask them, they only they open, they only open maybe two fingers wide. I'm like, okay, don't force it because a lot of people have a kind of anxiety over trying to open because it hurts. So they they try not to. But I ask them to slide their jaw side to side. So here's here's the value of this test is if their muscles are tight, they've strained their muscles and subsequently when they stretch their stretch their jaw, they really stretch and sore muscles. And that if that's their point of limitation. Then the joint, then the jaw will move very freely left and right, excursive. So if they have very smooth, unrestricted movements left and right, I'm going to say I'm going to blame it on muscles. But say we're talking about our right jaw joint, and I can move my jaw great to the right, which is my left condyle translating down. But when I go to the to the left. I can't go and I feel that brick wall effect. I'm going to call that intraarticular, that there's something, some obstruction within the joint that's keeping them from moving. So kind of looking at the, the picture, this this is again an MRI, and I tried to you know, for, to trace out all the, the things that external auditory canal, the blue line is the, the fossa and the eminence, here's the condylar head. And and this is, you know, this person trying to move forward. And when they try and move forward, here is a displaced disc or meniscus. It's anteriorly displaced. And there's really just 
you know, between open and closed, there's really no movement of that condyle. So they bump up against the, the displaced meniscus and I just can't go any further. So you know, this again is a case that, that um, it's inside the joint. And for me, I'm gonna say this, this goes back to using an arthrocentesis is really our best way to kind of get these patients moving quickly. Because if we put an appliance in and, and I'm gonna say, kind of looking at my diagram on the left, we talked about the retrodiscal tissues. If they, and someone that clinches, they squeeze those tissues together. When they squeeze them together, what ends up happening, you squeeze all the fluid out of it. So what happens is the retrodiscal tissues actually get stuck to the fossa. So a lot of times we blame it on the meniscus or disc being out of place and keeping them from moving forward. But it's really that the ligament is stuck and I call it sticky bubble gum. So it's adhesion, scar tissue, but it's really keeping them from moving. So this is where an arthrocentesis is great. We put a needle into the joint. I balloon up the joint space. I free up the sticky bubble gum. I move the joint around and then they make sure I keep the jaw moving to prevent them from getting re-adhesed again. So for these patients, you know, appliance therapy, if we can really confirm that they are not, um, that their lateral excursions are are good, they have no, and they're smooth and well coordinated, their opening is is limited and it's muscular. But if they have limited lateral excursions, uh, then we really have to say, you know, putting an appliance in, you know, decompressing the joints, whatever we might do is they really got a mechanical problem within their joints and, and appliance therapy kind of really doesn't really address that part of it. So this would be for me, hey, what are you doing next week? Because an arthrocentesis will go from having them open from 25 millimeters to, to normal range again quickly and then keep them keep it moving as part of our protocol to pre prevent it from getting re-adhesed. So um, a very, again, great procedure. This is an ideal indication for it. So next topic I want to talk about is, is kind of what about the patients that just can't wear an appliance? And I just want to, there's probably a, a whole host of reasons why, but just wanted to kind of present um, kind of a potential one one presentation, and this is an extreme example, but when this person opens their mouth, look at the size of their tongue and look at the imprints of their the, the scalloping on the tongue. So the thought would be is, is if we look like we're going to put a lower appliance in them and the, the, the lingual flange has any bulk to it in any way, then the tongue's going to say, you're crowding me. I'm already crowded. You're crowding me some more then no way am I going to let that go, let that sit in my mouth. Because when it sits in my mouth, it crowds my tongue. If it crowds my tongue, it pushes my tongue back, makes my airway even more constricted. And you're going to create anxiety, claustrophobia, things like this. And like, yeah, I can't put that in. And just for sake of discussion, you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of our patients will have kind of a, a gag reflex. And one of the thoughts is, is one of the theories around the gag reflex is, is somebody that is protecting their airway. So this, this like the picture on the left is, this person's really fighting to keep their airway open. Anything that, that gets anywhere close to blocking it or potentially obstructing or interfering with it in any way, basically the tongue's gonna, gonna express it uh, or you know, try to expel it, get everything out of the way so that nothing affects the airway. So just, an, uh, just a thought about gag reflexes and hyperactive gag reflexes why one of the reasons for that. So just an idea. So so with this patient, again, this might be one scenario for why people can't wear it. But the thing for me, there's the next thing, how do we manage it? And we you know, basically manage it by when we design our appliances, we make them as, as small as possible in the lingual, the least amount of intrusive, intrus intrusion into the, the tongue space. And a lot of times, when I'm seated in an appliance, the first question I'm going to ask before I even check any dots or stripes on it is, is how's your tongue feel? Well, it feels crowded. I'm like, well, where does it feel crowded? And I'll row in the lower anterior. I'm like, I take it back on my lathe and I'll just basically really recontour the whole thing, make it as possibly thin as possible. And one of the problems now is, is 
what happens to our crossovers, what happens to our protrusives. And I still find that we can still be able to still make that smooth, um, but you know, but there's a little bit of a compromise in that. But if a patient can't wear it, then you know, having any occlusal scheme based on an appliance, you know, becomes a moot point. So we kind of balance between well, can they wear it, and then how do we design our occlusal scheme to create the uh, the harmony of our of our occlusal muscle system um, so that it's as you know works well for them. So. So just an idea, again, my thoughts are for tonight is just really just giving you some some potential reasons why people might have these each of these issues. So again, and, and a little bit of my opinion. So you can take that for what that is. So um, the last one I want to talk about is kind of is persistent joint noises. So so a patient, you know, they're free of pain, the joint moves well, but it just makes noises. And that, you know, a lot of people, you know, that, that's a bothersome. Functionally, the joint works well, they're not having any, any pain. So I like to kind of describe this a little bit about when we have a disc that's displaced, when we're functional on our posterior ligament. I made the comment earlier that when we're doing that, our posterior ligament's kind of like a dense sponge. And being a dense sponge, when we apply, apply any occlusal pressure, a load to it, we squeeze all the fluid out of it. And we squeeze all the fluid out of it, a suction cup kind of is created between the retrodiscal ligament and the fossa. So now when we go to move our jaw, basically we have sticky bubble gum. So every time we see, have our condyle seated, we don't move our jaw for a period of time, sticky bubble gum gets restuck very quickly. So if we don't move our jaw for a period of time, it gets stuck. And then when we move it, we're freeing up the stickies. And if we moved our jaw 10 times, it clicks, it clicks. And the more we move it, it clicks less, less, and less. Because what we're doing is we're kind of smoothing out the, the sticky bubble gum, any surface irregularities. But as soon as you stop again, it gets stuck. So, so for me, this is kind of a mechanical problem. Appliance helps because I think if so a closal load, if we have a prematurity on one side, we'll compress that joint more. So really making sure our, our appliance is, is balanced. But with a balanced, well-equilibrated an appliance, appliance, if we can combine you know, range of motion, then I think we have a chance to kind of improve it. So here's kind of an example. This is um, my uh, thanks to Dr. Stephen Malone for these. This was one of our mutual patients. But basically, one of our things that we do is, is, really, the, is really just have people do lateral excursions. And we do it four times a day before they get out of bed in the morning. They stretch, you, you move your jaw a couple times during the day, especially those that, um, you know, people that are concentrating all day. They're, they're maybe not clenching, but they're holding, their muscles have tension. They're compressing their joint space. And if their sticky is already there, then every time they don't move their jaw for a period of time and compress their joint space, they get stuck again. So periodically just freeing up and, and one, Thing we describe this as is is kind of describe it like milling exercises every time you move your jaw you're smoothing out irregularities so the more you move your jaw over time it gets quieter so these little things it doesn't sound like a big deal but basically just if people can do this on a really regular basis as you know and we say habits are created if you can do something every day for 30 days in a row really just encouraging people just to kind of keep these exercises going even after like okay i'm done there's still some benefit to be to doing it so using range of motion and lateral excursions are way better than protrusive or opening wide and the reason for it is is excursions are all pure lateral pterygoid muscles no elevator muscles no masseter no temporalis muscle activation it's all lateral pterygoid so you're sliding but you're not compressing and sliding so if we're looking at milling down surfaces, light, gentle, repetitive forces are our friends. So the other thing I find is some people don't know how to do excursive movements. So one of the things I like to do is I, I like people to use their finger. If they put their finger between their, their teeth, their finger becomes their sensory, uh, uh, their sensor to kind of tell them that, um, you know, what's happening have people close their eyes, you put their finger there to be able to help them guide how to do this. 
So just little tips on, you know, because lateral excursive movements are not necessarily, we don't really do it intentionally. So some people just don't know how. So this is just a little, a little uh, uh, kind of trick to help people do it. So use your finger as a, as a test. 